Gray and Dr. Anthony Carroll um, join us today. So we all know Anne Claire, this is like the second home while she's been here for the last few years, but she's wrapping up next month. Um, so this is a great conclusion to her two years here. So we all know Anne Claire, she's kept the leaders very engaged through puzzle boxes, mobile food, filming them eat. Um, so it's going to be exciting to see it all put together. And then Anthony, he comes for short, intense bursts. Uh, where he basically wants every animal handled here, um, and he wants them to bite. And thanks to David, they only bite the bite for apparatus, which is fantastic. Those guys. <laughs> but Anthony has studied everything from lizards to crocodiles, and hopefully, I'm guessing the lemurs fall in between somewhere. So we will find out. Maybe the eyes, who knows, they might surpass crocodiles. So please, welcome. Hi. Thanks, everyone. Today I will present a work that I realized in collaboration uh, with all these great people. We speak David Brewer, Erin Anker, Erin Shaw, Kay Wester, and Christine Wall. I'm sorry if I mispronounce <coughs> one of the names. <laughs> and um, I will talk about the evolution of plant cell behavior and for morphology in primates. Or in mm -hmm. I have a background of paleontologists. And uh, as you may know, in paleontology, we mainly find fossils that are bone. And um, if you want to make the link between the behavior of an animal and the bone, you really need to study living species. And this is what I'm trying to do. And here, I'm interested in prehensile behavior, and I try to make the link between their prehensile behavior and the morphology of their bone. And if you are able to do that, the thing is that you can be able to reconstruct plant cell behavior of extinct species. Why plant cell behavior? It's a uh, behavior which is widespread among a lot of animals, and here it's just an example for the mammals. You can see that primates can do it with the tarsier, carnivora can do it with the otter, the bats can do it too, sloths, rodents, and there is much more animals that are able to grab the food and manipulate it. Previous studies have shown uh, uh, have, um, a might different kind of hypothesis. And I just made a selection, and this is the one that I will test during the following part of this presentation. And these previous studies have shown that grasping ability may have derived from arboreal locomotion, because when you are arboreal, you need to grasp the branches. And that can preset this kind of behavior. The second hypothesis is the capture of mobile prey. If you want to catch a little insect that is moving, it's much more easy to catch it with the hand. And the third one is one that I really like, is the infant carrying. And um, back in the days, one researcher has said that maybe because there are some species that are carrying the infant with the mouse, and those are ones that are carrying the infant on their fur, the, the infants really have to grasp the fur, and that can, um, the, the grasping behavior can derive from that. So why I went to the Duke Lemur Center to do that? Because this is just an amazing research facility with more than 18 or 19 species on which you can easily work. They behave really well. And it's really nice to have species that are really closely related to make this kind of study to try to understand evolution and original behavior. I want to link that to the shape. I will not go further on that. But my real specialty is the study of shape. I love to study the morphology. And as you can see, I'm able to make quantification using a lot of points of different color. And I will just go a little further to show you the result of that. But that will be after. OK. Why some of you have saw me making video of species eating every day? <laughs> <laughs> Such as this Loloris. And uh, now I understand why we call them Loloris. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and such as these other guys that were much more reactive and you just nearly have the time to put the food inside that they are already jumping on you and uh, start to eat. 
why do I was doing that and what I was doing with that. Okay, in collaboration with respect, we made a quantification of displanted behavior when they were eating their normal meal. What we have done is that we have defined five types of grips. Why? Because that will be easy for me in the future to add much more species. For example, if I want to add some frogs or lizards to make comparison with lemur, it's easy. They have most that and the five types of grabs that I have defined is the grasping with the mouse, or if they grab the food with one hand, two hands, the mouse and one hand, and the mouse and two hands. Then, previous studies have shown that there is uh, the size of the item and the consistency of the item that can have an effect uh, on the grasping behavior. And this is why we have defined big items as items that, that are bigger than the palm of the end, and small items that are smaller than the palm of the end. Concerning the consistency, we have defined hard foods such as apple, <coughs> and so on, and soft foods such as banana, grapes, and so on. Let's go to transfer to the first uh, hypothesis, and uh, concerning the arboreal locomotion hypothesis. The result uh, of uh, the quantification uh, of prehensile behavior have shown that species that uh, grasp big and hard items tend to use much more than hand, and then we made a kind of categorization of uh, the locomotion with some species that are much more terrestrial, such as the ringtail or the shifakas, and other ones that are highly arboreal and they spend all their time in the tree. And we show that uh, these species use highly much more their hands than the terrestrial species to grasp big and hard items. Concerning the small items, it seems that quite all of them prefer to use their mouse. We go back on the shape. <laughs> and um, I wanted to see if there is a relationship between the behavior and the shape. And the, good, the nice result is that, yeah, there is. And for example, it's just an example uh, of what I have done. And for the radius, you can see that the curved one are linked to these species that are also Ulemur, uh, Shifakas, Varesias, and so on. And, um, a curved radius is linked to animals that uh, grasp uh, big and hard items with one hand and small items with a mouse. Whereas a really straight radius is related to animals uh, that grasp with the mouse big and hard items that are all the uh, nocturnal ones. It's eye eye, bush baby, and slow loris, and so on. And they tend to use much more one hand and two hands for the small items. You can make the link, which means that if we have a bone of a fossil, we may be able to say uh, the prehensile behavior. Let's move on to the second hypothesis, the pre-catching, the one that, which is the most fun. <laughs> Let's start with the first one, with Morticia, that will go fast. <laughs> she gets it. <laughs> then, other ones such as Rouyo, don't have a really good code. Oh, no. Don't have a very really good coordination between what you see and what you see. Oh, my God. different kind of predations, such as Tiberius. And <laughs> and other one uh, have a technique that we call the, the technique of the martini and the oliva inside the martini, you will see. There is two ringtails that two times were using their mouse. But for all those other guys, they use one hand or two hands or one hand on the mouse or two hands on the mouse. 
concerning the last hypothesis, the infant carrying hypothesis. We have shown that species carrying infants on their fur use much more their hand, whereas species carrying infants with their mouths tend to use much more their mouth, which is quite cool. <coughs> and
But do you think it's the infants carrying in the fur that induces manipulative behavior or the other way around? Because they're a good manipulator, it's, they it's can actually hold on. It's a problem of uh, the eggs and uh, the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are the, so of the species here, the Mauricio would be the only diurnals that carry the infants in their mouth. And where do they fall out compared? Because I saw most of the nocturnals were. Uh, yeah, for most of the nocturnals, they carry with the mouse. You have uh, the Ayayan, the Varesia, both of them. And then you have a mix for the bamboo lemur. And uh, for the bush baby, mm -hmm. and for all those other guys, it's uh, easier. Mm -hmm. But that would be but they, So, but like the Borussia, do they eat, pick up things with their mouth much more frequently, more like the nocturnal? Yeah, it seems. When you look at the results, it seems that this is the case. A few of them initially tried to stop them moving out of their face. They got better from there, but it's just. <laughs> <laughs> so the foreman being curved, does that to allow for this this kind of manipulation with the forearm? For the curved ones, there is many hypotheses uh, that can be uh, because of uh, the body mass, that can be because of the insertion of muscle, and there is nothing right now that allows us to really say what it is. And, uh, we have another study with uh, Michael and Dan uh, concerning the locomotion, trying to link the forced exchange by the animal uh, with the environment during the locomotion, with uh, pig's force data and things like that. And we will try to answer that uh, and look at what is the effect of body mass and uh, what is the effect of the muscle also, because uh, we will start to make this section in Paris um, and the uh, quantification of the muscle and trying to see what are the relationships between muscle and morphology of the bone. But uh, right now there is plenty of hypotheses, but nobody is able to answer. That can be many factors. Maybe it's all of them. Actually, there is a, there might be a data set that's available, and old grad student at Duke had done a lot of dissections of the forelimbs yeah. at the lemurs here. So that data might actually be available that they could use to look at that. So this is one of the things that I, that I really wanted to do. Um, 
So getting these data on mammals in general is, is not straightforward. It's easy to do for bats. I've done uh, hundreds of species of bats because you can catch them, you can manipulate them, they're small. When you think about bigger things, like people always ask me, have you measured bears? Maybe if they want to come in. Perhaps. But, <laughs> You know, bears, wolves, I mean, it's not easy, it's not straightforward. Because what, really what you want to get at is like the maximum capacity of an animal, how hard you can really bite. And so I could put out a transducer with some meat on it, but as soon as the animal's biting on it, it's going to feel the transducer, it's going to be like, yeah, phew, no way. It's going to take off the meat and eat it somewhere else. So it's kind of hard to elicit these maximum bite forces. This is one of the great things, it's like, as soon as they see this, they want to bite. <laughs> So especially if you catch an animal, and so that's why if you can catch an animal, if you can hold it, the immediate response is it won't take two months to get away, and you can measure these bite forces quite easily. And we get very repeatable data. So I can measure it 10 times, I can measure it this year, next year. We get highly repeatable data. And so I'm working in Paris at the National History Museum, and so in Paris we also have a colony of mouse lemurs. We have about 450. And so I've been playing around with the mouse lemurs, and they're really excellent animals to work with. And so that's one of the reasons I also why I wanted to come here, because I know it works, doesn't hurt the animals at all, they're totally fine with it. They can bite and they soon, and they're, they're totally good afterwards. And so one of the nice things about the mouse lemurs in Paris is that we actually have a student now who's measuring heritability and these kind of things. And so she's measuring all 450. We established a whole genealogy, we're doing some sequencing to know who the fathers are, because they have this kind of strange mating system where you have to have one for males and one female. So we know who the mother is, but we don't know who the fathers are. So we're going back to all the old records, basically sequencing samples from all the old specimens to get this genealogy. So we can actually understand if the mother is a good biter, the father is a good biter, is the baby a good biter as well? To try and understand, can we link this up? And can we understand how these traits are transmitted through different generations? And so she's doing this for bite forces, for pulse traits, measuring the heart, you can pull on things, grasping the locomotion, that's what happened. She's also looking at behavior. Just measuring behavioral traits for all these animals and really looking at how do these traits basically go from one generation to another. So, it's going to so, so thus my interest in lemurs also and the great opportunities to come and work here. The other reason why I think lemurs are really great is because in Paris in the collections, we have one of the biggest collections of lemurs in the world because it used to be part of, my husband used to be part of France, and so they collected lots of specimens. So now we can use these, we can CT scan them, we can get data on the morphology of these animals. So you can see the typical tooth going here of this animal. You can see the typical morphology um, of this animal. The nice thing is, this is a happy lemur, a bamboo lemur. Um, the nice thing is, there's lots of variation. This is, this is the eye. It's the craziest mammal skull I've ever seen. Like, it, I can look at this a hundred million times and still be amazed. I mean, it has no tooth row, ever growing incisors. It's, it looks like a rodent. So if I would show you a, a cut through this, the incisors go all the way back, those incisors go all the way back into the skull. It's a really bizarre animal. And so you have all this variation within a group of closely related animals. And so we can, we can exploit this and actually look and see what's going on. So the question that would be really interesting is, is this morphology in the head really related to the functional demands opposed by the food? And kind of like I was saying for grasping as well, if, if you have to grasp something that's big or small, you're going to do something different. Same thing if you want to bite a hard big object, object, you're going to probably have to change the way you do it and involve like harder bite forces. And so with the, with the different diet categories, so frugivores mostly in the soft food, so I'm expecting them to have very or relatively low bite forces. It doesn't really impose any special demands on the morphology, so I'm expecting a very generalized morphology. This is also what we find in bats and other animals that we've looked at. It's kind of a generalist Insectivores, a lot of the insects that they're eating have pretty tough exoskeletons. Like the downside of the insect is its skeleton. It's on the outside, and so it's pretty pretty hard to crunch through. If you have a big beetle, I mean, you can you can need several pounds of force to get through the exoskeleton of the beetle. And so we predict kind of higher bite forces in these animals that have to eat these harder objects. And for example, one way you can get higher bite forces is to make the muscles on the skull bigger. And there's two big muscles, the masseter and the fibrillus here. As you make the muscles bigger, you're probably going to have higher bite forces. And so this would say that this part of the skull would get bigger relative to this part if I wouldn't want to get higher bite forces. That's a hypothesis. And we can go in and we can test this. I'll show you a little bit later whether that's true or not. And then finally, once they eat leaves, I mean, the leaves 
You may think of like, oh, it's a herbivore, it's not going to bite hard. The leaves are actually very tough and fibrous, and it's really difficult to eat leaves. And if I go through my data for like, all the different animals I've looked at, the ones that consistently bite the hardest are ones that eat things like leaves. So it's not your crocodile, it's not your lion that's going to be the best biter. It's actually the ones that eat plants that are typically the hardest biters. It's a bit counterintuitive, but if you think about the mechanics of how you have to destroy plant material, it makes a lot of sense. And so again, this is something we can test and we can see if these, these things that eat leaves, these specialized leaf eaters, actually have higher bite forces. And so for those guys, I would predict both large muscle insertion areas, you need lots of muscle, and also short snout. There's a reason why we think this is because if you think about how the muscles act, so the muscles are going to pull on the mandible here, they're going to generate bite forces here, in the front of the, for example, of the canines. If I take an animal with a really short snout here, well, if I have the same muscle forces here, the bite force is going to be twice as big if the snout is half as long. I mean, that's just the basic lever. If you take a lever and you might lift something, the longer the lever, easier it's going to be to lift. But in this case, the shorter the lever, the same amount of muscle force, the higher the bite force. And so we can look at these kind of things. We can make little bite accounting models. We can play with this kind of data to kind of make predictions and then test these predictions based on the real data that we can get from the animals. So we measure bite forces. Um, this is one of our guys. This is Dave. Without Dave, <laughs> impossible to do any of this. Um, so I have a little device here. So there's a the sensor that's actually measuring the forces is back here. It's a small crystal. It's a piezoelectric crystal. And so piezo crystals have a unique property: is if you deform them, they send off a little current, and we can measure the current. And the current is proportional to the deformation. And so we can measure how much force you need to deform the crystal. And so we can measure the forces that the animal is exerting here, its teeth. On the transducer. So it's a very simple device, it's portable, I can take it anywhere in the world, very easy to do. And like I said, the animals are pretty happy to bite. So the, the thing we really have to worry about is our hands more than anything else. Um, so we cover the bite force uh, plates here with tape so that it's, you don't hurt their teeth. It also leaves an imprint, and so we can see exactly where they've been biting because it's going to be important for us to correct that relative to the beaver that they're biting. So we can get these data quite easily. Um, we can also measure their heads. So he's much more mellow when we're measuring heads. He's like, yeah, whatever. It's all good. Um, but we can get all this data. And so we can link it back up and see if animals have these bigger heads, especially here at the back of the head, how tall your head is. Does that give you more bite force? Because that needs more muscle. So we can test these hypotheses and kind of see if we can link that up. Bite forces, just to give you a <coughs> smattering of data for a few individuals, mouse lemurs. They weigh about 100 grams, roughly, based on the average that I had for my animals. They weigh about 3.5 kilograms, or about 6.6 .6 pounds of force. That's pretty good for a small guy. If you know that their teeth are pretty sharp, that's why it hurts. Push baby, Pretoria, one kilo, that's about 12 times their human body mass. That's pretty good. <laughs> Like if you take a human, I weigh 80 kilos. If I can bite like five times my body mass, that's a lot. This guy, it's a tiny little animal, but he can bite really hard. And so what you see is that these guys in general, the lemurs bite really hard for across the mammals that I've been there. You don't have to tell us that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm happy. <laughs> um, if you take a ringtail, it weighs about 1.1 kilo, bites about 15 kilos. So they're pretty good right? Um, high dice, <coughs> and so these, the forces I'm, I'm listing here are on the back of the tooth row, on the molar. So, because the other thing I didn't say that is we mentioned bite forces at the molar, at the back, but also at the front of the mouth. And that's because there's hypotheses about how some animals are specialized for biting at the incisors versus the molars. For example, the eye, everybody knows it gnaws wood, and so it's biting at the front. And so we could expect it to be specialized for that behavior because that's really what it does in the wild. So it's also something we need to test. So these forces are all through the back. That's the back the and then fox um, actually have really good bite forces. Um, and really, you don't want to put your fingers in the mouth of a chifox. Because that would not be good. <laughs> Just to give you a, a rough idea, and if you want to, be to compare that to like crocodiles, um, they bite as hard as a crocodile of the same size. No differences. Of all the animals I've measured, the hardest biting things like small lizards for their body size. So if you correct it for body size, 
and little anoles that you see out here, little green ones, they bite for their body size ten times as hard as a crocodile. So it can, you see all these TV shows like, oh, crocodile, 16,000 mutants. Like, yeah, but it's a really big animal. It's, it's, it's normal if you're big, you can bite hard. <laughs> so, so that's why it's interesting to move back these different things. And say, okay, why does this animal bite hard versus this other animal? And can we explain these kind of differences that we see? Is it related to diet? Is it related to other things? And if you think about mammals in general, the head of a mammal does many different things. There's a big brain in there, especially in primates. The eyes and ears and nose, all the sensory organs are in there. And so the, the skull does many things. It protects the sensory organs, has a big brain, and yes, there's also some muscle. If I take a lizard, it has the same sensory organs, but it has a very small brain. So I can put much more muscle in that head. And so it bites a lot harder. And so you, it's, it's kind of, you're going to play with these constraints, these spatial constraints. There's only so much space in the head. And you can put muscle in there or a big brain, and you can't do both. And so that's why we see these different things. Is the average human by force? Hmm? Human? Yeah. So it depends on the population also. So if you measure people from the high Andes versus Europeans versus people from different countries, there's huge differences in body force. Um, which most people don't know, but it's like we did, uh, I went to Argentina to give a course in uh, biomechanics, and I had the translator with me, so we had everybody bike in the, in the class. And, uh, and so there was one guy who is a native uh, Indian from the high Andes, like uh, a Quechua Indian, and his bike forces were way lower. And then we went through literature, there's not much data out there, but that's actually a common pattern. And so humans can bite a male human my size, a thousand mutants. So it's 100 kilograms of force. So about by body weight and force. That's, that's not bad for a white male Western <laughs> European. <laughs> so are these numbers that you have up here for the molars? That's for the molars, the back of the, back of the mouth. So if we look at our, our animals, so what I've plotted just here, just to give you just a rough overview, the details don't matter so much. This is the size of the animal, this is the bite force at the molars. Um, larger animals, larger bites. That's pretty obvious. I mean, the bigger you are, the bigger your head is, the harder you go to bite. So that's not a big surprise. Um, if we do the same thing, we put the head dimensions. Of all the things we measure on the head, one's the best predictor of bite first is how tall your head is. Yeah, so once you have taller heads, bite harder on average. So it's a pretty nice correlation that you can see here. But that's pretty consistent across many different animals I've measured. It's the same in bats, it's the same in the Lemurs, it's the same at many lizards. The taller in the head, the harder you bite. And that's probably because the way you can arrange the muscles in the head, you can put a much more, a much better way to contract if the head's tall relative to as the head is flat. And then you have to put them at an angle and you lose force. Basically. So it's kind of a consistent pattern that we're finding here. Um, so I told you we've measured lower and incisive biting. So this is all the lemurs, nice pattern. This is our, our outline. This guy is doing something that no other animal I've ever measured, and I've measured thousands. It's biting harder, twice as hard at the front of the mouth than it does at the back. By mechanically, that's impossible. <laughs> so it's doing something that, from a mechanics perspective, it shouldn't be able to do. Because as you go from the front to the back, you're decreasing that length, that snout length, that out lever, and so you should be increasing bite force as you go from the front to the back. It's not the case. It's the only animal I've ever measured, but that's not the case. And that's kind of interesting. So it can mean two things. One, it's magical. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's from outer space. And that's what it looks like in many cases. It's, it's not doing something right. Um, two, it has a really hard time biting at the back of the mouth because it's so specialized biting at the front. And that's probably why it's my hypothesis, why we're seeing this really high front body force versus back body force. Do you see any difference in like canines versus incisors? Are canines higher? Yeah. So I mean, they're also further back, but so the canines are a little bit higher because they're a bit further back. On the other hand, there's a bit of a so the animals don't like biting on the canines. The reason why that is the case is because it generates a lot of torque. Because they're biting on one side of the canines, the canines are really long. I mean, you've all seen the canines between the mouth. And so, if, as you're biting on this one, you tend to twist 
the mandible, and that produces a lot of torque in the, in the joint, and they don't like that. So if we're measuring on the canines, I'm not sure we're measuring the mechanical ability of the animal to do something. Because I think they're just preventing it now. I mean, mammals have lots of receptors in the teeth, in the joints, and so we sense it when we bite them too hard and they're doing something wrong, and you stop biting. And they're no different. They're going to stop biting. So I'm, I'm thinking we're not measuring as hard bite forces on the canines just because the animals don't want to. I guess what I'm wondering is if, if the incisors of the eye are yeah. points, yeah. if the, the force would be greater. Yeah. So, so there's two different things. So one is force. So the force is independent of the contact area. So it's the mechanical okay. force. The pressure, that's the amount of force per unit area. That's hugely different if you have sharp teeth. So the sharper your teeth is, the higher the pressures are. And what's going to be important when you try to gnaw through something, an object or whatever, is not only the force, but also the pressures. And that's why they have these really sharp incisors on the eye. So it's, it's the, the, the game between force and pressure that's going to be really important when you think about an animal actually breaking something. Too. But the, the pressures are really hard to measure because we need to know exactly the size of the surface area of what they're biting. And so that's why we usually measure force. It's just because it gives us a global idea of what the animal is doing. So, so Anthony, are the eyes unique compared to rodents too? Like, yep. Really? Okay, yep. so wow. Like all the rodents I've met in the official reasonable amount of the rodents, they all bite hard on the molars with first the incisors. Even compared to rodents, they're, they're completely unique. It's the only animal. And I'll, I'll go back to the image of the eye if you want, and I'll, I can show you why I think that's the case. Um, and so the, the nice thing is also, like, because we have this, all this data in vivo now, we know what the animals can do, we can compare it to some of the data that's out there. And Steve Perry, also who used to work here quite a bit, did this uh, model. It's called the Greaves model. It's a model based on basically skulls, and you measure on the skulls some, some distances, and you calculate the bite forces. And so, so now we have in vivo bite forces, and we can compare and see how good the models are in predicting real bite force. And so this is kind of what we get. So there's a, there's a correlation. So if, if you can model it, you know something about the bite force. However, you explain about 45% of the real bite force data. And so you can do some things with the model, but not everything. And so if you really want to understand what's going on, you do have to measure these live animals. It's really important to, to be able to do that. And that's why it's so great to actually be able to work here and just measure that from live animals. Because we are vastly underestimating the real forces if we just do biomechanical models. And so knowing what these animals are doing in the wild allows us to improve the models also. And then we can get better estimates of what the animals are doing. Muscle anatomy. So this is uh, data from the literature. Uh, I didn't do this. Again, Steve Perry uh, got data. Um, and that was published. And so he has data for 15 species that I also have bite force data for. And so we can look at these, these correlations between the muscles and, and what's actually going on. So this is an animal that he got in Madagascar. They had an animal die there. He flew over there, got the, uh, got the animal, measured all the muscle data um, from, a, from a site in Madagascar. So this is that masseter muscle I was talking about. That's one that's just down here. Um, and that's the temporalis muscle up here, the top of the head. So it's right here. So these are the big muscles that we looked at. And so they measured lots of traits, uh, muscle traits, and so we can look at how that's correlated to the bite forces. And so here I have basically the cross-sectional area of the, the muscle. That's a good measure of how strong the muscle, how much force the muscle can produce. If you take a muscle, you cut it, just if that's the muscle the length wise, you cut it, what you get is the cross-section, and that gives you the idea of how many muscle fibers are in the muscle. And for every single fiber, you get a certain amount of force. And so the more fibers, the more muscle force you can get. And so it's a good estimate of force capacity. And so if we look at that, so these are my frugivores. So there's a pretty good correlation there. Um, these are my folivores. As I said in the beginning, they should be getting higher bite forces because they probably play with the muscles, but not only with the muscles, but they're doing other things. And again, they're above your average. So they're doing something other than just having a lot of muscles. And these are my insectivores, right here. This is my eye. <laughs> so eye is doing something weird, because at the molars, it's producing much less force than what you would predict. And so again, that comes back to my comment previously, that I think it's just it's unable to produce high forces in the molars. That's why it's biting so hard on the incisors relative to the molars. It's nothing to do with the incisors. I think it's all to do with the molars, where it just can't bite for 
Your molars are quite small now for the IIs, yeah. aren't they? Versus totally. something similar. I mean, yeah. is that a chicken or an egg thing too with the diet? No, not so much. I think it's a, it's really, um, and I'll go back to the the end of the the IIs call, and I'll show it because uh, I think it's really it tells a lot of the story. So if you look at incisor bed force, again, these are my frugivores. Now I have my insectivores and my IIs right there. <laughs> so it's doing something quite different. And so if I tra trace my regression line, again, we can see that the insectivores on the incisor are pretty good biters. So whether you look at the incisor or the molar, you get the insectivores being the best biters or the folivores. So it really depends. If you think about how folivores chew plant matter, it's on the molars, it's not on the incisors. Because the insectivores mostly chew on the incisors. So again, it's linked to the behavior of the animals and what they're doing. And so it's quite interesting to get these data together. So I think in conclusion, um, our II remains number one, I think. It's a really exceptional animal. Um, we, we find these relations between diet and bite force, and we're going to add some species. Back in, the, back in the France and in Belgium, there's a couple of zoos where we're going to work. We have some Galagos and Galances, little Galagos bush babies. Uh, we have some other species of lores that we can work with. And add a few more species and really see if we can get some more data on that. Um, Muscle data predict bite force, but only partly. Again, it's not, I can't get 100% of the bite forces based on the muscles. I can't get 100% bite forces based on the biomechanics. Really, you need to have all the information if you want to predict what the animal is going to do. So what we're going to do, well, I mean, we're going to make unclear work. We're going to get the data on the shape, like she was showing for the, for the long bones of the, the forelimb, so that, that the ulna and the radius or the humerus. We'll do the same thing for the cranium and the mandible. We have these CT scans, we have scans of these animals from the collections. So we can do this and, and link that up and see how good is the shape a predictor of bite force. Because if it's a good predictor, then like I like was saying, we can look at fossil species and, and make inferences. Um, and what it costs for chewing, somebody else here has been doing lots of chewing data, and uh, Chris has been getting metabolic data. And so like, what is the cost of chewing? How much energy, energy do you use when you're chewing? And what I'm interested in is like, if you have higher bite forces, does that reduce the cost of chewing? Does it make you more efficient in chewing? And that may be a reason why you have higher bite forces as well. And so these are the kind of questions that we're looking at. And so it's great to have all these different data sets that we can kind of link up together and so see what's going on in different things. And like I said, and then you want to look at those kind of things, or those kind of things, um, these fossil species, and see if we can predict their bite forces and see, see what did they do. How hard were they able to bite? And also, what was their ecology? Were the leaf eaters, were the insect eaters, were the frugivores? And that allows us to better understand also the evolution of these different ecologies through evolution history and the time of the, of the leaves. And with that, some people that gave me some money to come out here, which is great. And Claire is paid by the Hanson Fieson. And of course, everybody here, like really, really, really great thanks. It's, uh, it's super good work here. You know. I can add more miles to my fleet and fire car and come back any day because it's, it's just great. It's, it's really fun to work here. I really appreciate all the help by everybody for us to, uh, to be able to do this work. Thank you very much. So I'll just show you guys the, the weird molars of the eye. Yeah, it's on. So these are, it's what Dave was saying, like the molars are really, really unusual. They're very, like the tooth is really short, the incisors are huge. And so what I think is going on is they can bite here at the molars. Look at how weird that joint is. Like there's no other mammal that has a joint like this. Because it's just two surfaces kind of gliding or sliding along one another. That's a normal joint, you know? You get this nice notch here, it fits in there. It's really well braced. These guys, there's no bracing at the joint. And so if they're biting here at the mandible, this is gonna, it's gonna push the joint backward, the mandible relative to the cranium. And I think it's, it's dislocating its jaw, and so it's just not biting hard. It's like, that's, that's it, I'm not destroying my own mandible. <laughs> I mean, they're not that dumb. <laughs> So I mean, I really think that's what's going on. So it's really optimized for biting here on the incisors. They can, they can, I mean, they're still biting hard in the molars. It's, it's hard enough for them to do, to reduce any type of food that they eat in nature, insects or some fruits or whatever. They can, they can chew it. It's not a big deal. 
but they're just not using the full capacity of their muscles because I think there's an issue here at the joint where they just can't deal with it. Because that, that's, that morphology is so unique. I mean, there's really, there's nothing like it. If it's allowed to drop, does it get better leverage? So what I think it's doing is actually sliding. So there's, there's like turtles, for example, do something similar. They slide the lower jaw relative to the upper jaw. And that will give you rodents doing as well. And so that will give you a better, like you see, they're not fully aligned. So it gets you better alignment of the insiders. So I think you're sliding that mandible back and forth. As opposed to up and down. Yep. So you're sliding it forward and then open. And that probably gives them a better bite at the incisor, um, which is really what we're looking for. But the consequence of that is that <coughs> if you're biting here, then that's going to dislocate the jaw. So you don't want to do that. What muscle allows the jaw to slide? So there's, so there's a the masseter which is sitting here. Right. There's also a part of the masseter that goes this way. And so if that contracts, then it will also slide and then goes forward. But that makes, that makes such complete sense when you think about what they're eating in the wild. These guys are eating canarium fruit in the wild and they're, they're opening those nuts. This is a nut that's as hard as a walnut, super hard. But they're doing it with those incisors. Yep. And what they do is they, they score the nut lengthwise, and then they turn it, and they use the teeth as a as a as a crowbar, yeah. and they pop off the the. It's kind of a small door on the on the seed, and the meat they eat the meat that's inside, and they're using their finger to get that out and to chew that up. It's not so hard, and to chew insect larvae like. Grubs, exactly. It's it's not so hard. So yeah. that's just mm -hmm. so that would be like <laughs> the morphology really matches the behavior of the yeah. animal. And again, that's that's kind of what we're looking at. Is yeah. How good is the match between morphology and behavior? And if the match is good, then we can say something in a fossil when you have just the morphology. You can actually say something. That's and that's really one of the approaches that we're interested in to try to make this up. So you were talking about brains earlier. Yeah. That they have big brains to protect, and the fact that the eyes have huge relative. Brain sizes. Those are, do you have any? If you looked at all the brain sizes, I can imagine you should walk in. But, um, but that, to see if there's any correlation with animals that need, so they, these guys have huge brains and they have to yeah. sort of develop something unusual to yeah. accomplish yeah. that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's something we haven't done yet, but it's something we want to do. Because we have the CT scans, and so the nice thing about the CT scan is you can also look inside, get the volume. So, it's we're not measuring the brain itself, but the volume that the brain is supposed to more or less take up. It's not 100% correlates, but we can, we can actually get a good estimate based on CT scans. So that's something we'd love to do. How hard would this be How hard would this be able to pull off doing real-time imaging? You know, restraining one and getting it to bite, you know, with it and seeing how that jaw works. So I mean, you, can, you can do that if you have a, an extra video machine. So in Paris, we have one, for example, with my receivers, we can do this. We can get the food and film and we have two X-ray machines, we get three D uh, on how the jaws move. Again, you have to have a facility where you can so because the doses the X-rays are really low, so it's not really an issue for the animals. Um, but that would seem to be fascinating how that eye jaw especially would move under. I would love to get these guys on the X-ray machine and see what they're doing. That's if you want to send me a few, I mean <laughs> Have you been able, have you had the chance to measure bite force of Prolemur simus, the greater bamboo members? No. So we have, there's some in the, the new zoological park in Paris. Right. And so that's one of the things we want to do is go in uh, their their head shape is just so unique and they have this <coughs> huge as you know, the huge area yeah. along the mandible, I guess, for the massive yeah, muscle. That's all, that's all insertion for the muscle. Muscle attachment there, yeah. you know, for tearing apart this tough bamboo, which has got to be difficult to do, but it's, they're just fascinating. Yeah, yeah so and even like this guy, so this is also, this is all audacious, it's one of the bamboo members. I mean, you can totally see how, how this is all muscle insertion area. And again, it's not nothing compared to the big one. Right. That's this whole area goes way up here. It's way, way out here. So we've got a huge muscle that's sitting there. So it'd be really fun. That's so why I said like, it'd be fun to add a few more species kind of broaden it out a little bit and see, see what we can find. And it's incredible how even on live individuals you can really notice yeah. that. I mean, it just stands out. You don't have to be looking at a skull. Yeah. 
Uh, I, I put in my request. <laughs> so, if going back to the IX call, right? So that that basically, what what do the temporalis muscles look like on these guys in master? Cause I, and, and maybe Max, you know, some of the worst Max is down here too. Yeah. Like, so are they exceptionally big to allow this sort of bite force, or do they just they're huge? Okay. I think, well, I think Jonathan should they look Wow. So this is all masseter? Yeah. So it's it's big, but it's not so big. So their jaw muscles are not bigger than any other primate, really. For cross-sectional area? Yeah. Yeah, they have very long fibered muscles. Yeah. So I mean, the, the, the cross-sectional area is how much force they, they use. The long fibers means that you reduce the cross-sectional area a little bit. So the ideal way to get much more force out of it is to get like a tendon, and then really short fibers on the tendon. And that gives you lots of force for a given volume of muscle. And they don't have that they have these long fibers because they have to open, to open their mouth very far. And if you have short fibers, you can't open very far. So again, it's this kind of trade off. It's a thing compromise the whole yeah. time. Because I was looking at the like the nuchal crest on that skull is, is pretty small. Yeah, actually. there's not a compared. Yeah, yeah, I mean yeah. what you would expect for the temporalis yeah. muscle, right? But it, again, like this is a big temporalis, so it is big. Yeah. So it's 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 pretty good. But it doesn't really have that crest. And again, this is probably going back to a big huge brain that's inside. Yeah, yeah. Right, you're limited. So you could, I mean so it's always a matter of trade-offs. Like there's only so much you can do, and you have to play with these constraints. And so they've played with the constraints. They've optimized by in here. Consequence is that they've lowered back force. I mean, it's, right. There's trade-offs in the well, system. For you or anyone else in the room, has like the Dalmatonia robusta, right? Or uh, have we have any mandible? We only have the tooth, or do we have more? I don't know. Yeah, I don't think there's a yeah, whole yeah, mandible. I was wondering if they also show a similar. Yeah, I don't think there's a whole mandible. Yeah. I yeah. know. So, but yeah, they're really, really bizarre. Just Yeah, right. It's just highly evolved. Bizarre is good. Do you know, has anyone, you guys can do this with your micro CTs, has anyone looked at enamel thickness on their molars? Nobody's done it. Because it would be really yeah. interesting to know if they're thicker than enamel, because I wonder if they've reduced those teeth so much, I wonder if part of the way that they reduce the is to thin the enamel, but they also be getting lots of appropriate reception from the molar saying, I'm fine. Yeah. But also the joint receptors. I mean, yeah. It's, I'm sure it's playing Yeah, we can look at it. That would yeah. be really neat to I mean, know. the teeth in these things are also like, I mean, it's the only primate that has like rodent teeth. How cool is that? <laughs> so we have some IIs that have malocclusion and their teeth overgrow, and then we chop off the tip. But you could get an animal measurement on for the incisors. For the incisors, yeah, that would be really interesting. And I, actually, I think Aaron's been saving us. Yeah. Just oh, really? Mm -hmm. No, there's. I mean, I mean, anything like the growth of the teeth, also like in embryo <laughs> embryology, like. How do they develop? I mean, there's so many questions you can do with these things. It's uh, just amazing. I love them. <laughs> that would actually be the, the, the mechanism for ever growing incisors in mice is really well understood yeah. because yeah. there's such common genetic oh, research and all that would be really neat to know if it was the same in the eye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Max so had thought about like trying to do that. We know quite a bit about the genetics and they're buying that, and so if you could do the same with. Yeah. That mass is really interesting that it's just really, you have to get a sample from the base of the tooth. Well, they don't die. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Bullet tooth every couple of weeks. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah, but, but like a specimen like this, a freshly dead animal, you can actually get some data. You know, I wish Jonathan had been able to do that. And also for embryos, if you look at the embryos and see what's going on, the tooth development, that would be really 